John King USA, CNN, weeknights 7 Eastern. Mohammed, let me start with you. You believe 2,000 plus have been killed in this brutal crackdown. I don't doubt your numbers at all, but since we can't get in there, we've had reporters in there very briefly, the government won't let us in. I just want our viewers to get a sense of, of how you're in touch with a network of activists in the country, how you come about these numbers. Basically, we're in touch with a huge number of people via Skype and via social networking. People are reporting the number of deaths, and this more than 2,000 uh, get killed. We have names and location and date of their killed, and we expect the number is very higher than that, but that's the names we managed to document uh, and basically more more people are afraid uh, they broke the fear and they're not afraid now to report about the death about the arrest and about torture incident and, and as it plays out Shibley we've heard ratcheting up of the international condemnation but a presidential statement only not a resolution from the Security Council I want you to listen here to the US ambassador to the United Nations Susan Rice I spoke to her yesterday and she insists the regime is starting to feel some pressure is there any evidence, Ambassador, any evidence at all that President Assad feels enough heat to even think about stepping aside? Well, he's certainly feeling more and more heat, uh, John, with every day. The heat is coming in various forms. Uh, the economy is crumbling. The people of Syria are rising up in city after city, day after day, night after night, making plain that they, they are determined to forge a, a future of freedom. Uh, and democracy, and that that does not include Bashar al-Assad. Really, though? I mean, he is killing his own people. We saw more images today. It seems that his reaction is to intensify the crackdown, not to think about leaving. There's no question. Look, I mean, if, if he's looking at if you look at it from his point of view, first of all, he'd rather be where Gaddafi is, not where Mubarak is, not in a cage, for one thing. Uh, he can assume that there will be no military intervention against him. There won't be from anybody from the outside. Uh, an international resolution that might come from the UN is unlikely to materialize if it, it is strong because of Russian likely veto. Um, he has not seen huge demonstrations in Aleppo and Damascus, the two largest cities. Seen some in Damascus, there's more evidence of it today, but not on the scale of elsewhere. So he can, uh, he has had some defections to the military, but not on the large scale. So he can, he can really believe that he can withstand that. I don't think he can actually. I think, uh, I think he's now at a point of no return for a number of reasons because the battle of wills. Right. And even if he doesn't heat the, feel the heat directly, uh, all of this is emboldening the people. It's a right. battle of wills. The public is out there. The barrier of fear has been broken. It's expanding to many different uh, cities. It's very hard to turn around. And you met with the Canadian foreign minister today, I think I have that right. And so what are you looking for in terms of from the Human Rights Committee? If Russia and China won't sign on to a tough UN Security Council resolution, that means no sanctions from the United Nations Security Council. What can everyone else do? They can push more for sanctions, and uh, that's the word for, uh, for Foreign Minister, Canadian Foreign Minister. There's a crack in the wall with the Russians, and let's push now and to make this crack bigger and bigger. And I met with Secretary Clinton two days ago as well, and that's what we asked Secretary Clinton, that we need President Obama to say publicly he, he has to step down. That's and what's I, her explanation? Why won't he? Uh, she asked three questions about the unit, unity of the opposition, about the minority. Uh, joining or not, or not joining the protest and uh, the political vacuum of the president absence and we answered we addressed those three issues with her and I, I, I think her statements the strong statements in, in the last uh, 24 hours was based on the view and the explanation we, we provided and we asked Canada especially Canada because uh, US has no oil and gas companies working in in Syria we're working now with Europeans and Canadians to impose oil and gas sanction because I think the economy factor is going to be a key factor when the government cannot finance this military operation I think we're going to win this battle and you make an important point I think when you make the would rather be like Gaddafi than like Mubarak. I, I want to follow up on that a couple ways. But first, the Arab League was key to the U.S. and the NATO operation in Libya because the Arab League said he had lost his legitimacy. The Arab League has been silent when it comes to Bashar al-Assad. Why? Well, I think it's complicated, but it's not just the Arab League. I mean, in the Gaddafi case was always a unique case. In part, there were so many different factors, uh, including score settling with Gaddafi, like with Saudi Arabia, essentially score, you know, settling scores. But the, the, the interesting thing is that you had public opinion, Arab public opinion, supporting international intervention. You do not have it in the case of Syria. Even people who are angry with Syria... Uh, you don't find the public opinion pushing for a military intervention by the international community. They want, they want pressure, but they want international intervention. I think with the, in, the, in, the, in the Gulf states, obviously, 
they're also worried that ultimately, you know, they're not yet comfortable that this is not going to come back to haunt them. And this has been the, the interesting situation, particularly uh, with the case of Syria. Take us inside. When we listen, our Arwa Dame has been doing fascinating reporting. You have your network of activists. We see these some demonstrations peacefully in the streets, but otherwise you hear about the siege in Hama, the Syrian military moving to other places. In terms of a humanitarian crisis and needs, uh, how many people are without food, without medical supplies, afraid to go out of their house because they think a sniper might shoot them? Exactly. Now that's the case in Hama and it's going to be the case soon in Derizor as well because the, the tanks are besieging Derizor with 300 tanks. Uh, the government did not, did not pay the salaries for, for people and they're preventing the food trucks to enter or get out of the city. No electricity, no water and no communication. It's the same case with Hama now for more than four days and the people cannot even get out of the home to bring food or something. And furthermore, they attacked hospital, they shut down the uh, electricity generator for hospitals and that caused lots of deaths and in, in, uh, death uh, bodies in, in the hospitals. We're, we're talking now about humanitarian crisis and that was again one of the demands from the international community to push more to, to allow the ICRC to enter Syria and do some humanitarian efforts.